Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. When you need to scale your API, one of the first things developers think about is, let's just add a cache. Well, if it were only that simple. Let's go over some things to consider so that you end up being successful in your caching strategy because you're about to introduce a whole new set of problems. So the typical reasons why people end up adding a cache is because they want to reduce load on their database because that's a harder thing often for them to scale because they can't necessarily scale out depending what type of database you're using. So most people think, okay, well immediately if I introduce a cache, that way we can hit the cache rather than having all that extra load, all those requests to our database, we can kind of offload this to our cache. The first question is, what are you caching? Are you caching exactly a one-to-one -one mapping which in your database into the cache? Or rather, are you doing some type of data composition and you're persisting that in your cache? What I mean by that is let's say we have a book, something in our database, that's a record, and this is what we're persisting also in our cache. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. So we have the ISBN, the title, some author ID, the date it was published, and the number of pages. This is exact one-to-one -one mapping to our database. Or are we doing something like this? where we actually are making multiple queries, building up some type of composition of data, where it's just not the author ID, we actually have information about the author. We have other aggregated data, maybe separately, about the number of reviews that have been placed, the total rating, the price. There's more details, we're doing a composition here. I'd like to thank Current for sponsoring this video. Current's an event native data platform that fields real-time business critical data with historical context in fine-grained streams from origination to destination enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Current, check out the link in the description. The reason why this matters is because it can help your decision-making and your strategy. If you're just having a one-to-one -one on persisting what's in your cache to what's exactly in your database as records, then you don't actually probably need a cache the way you're thinking about it. Alternatively, you could just use read replication. If your database supports read replicas, which most would, you could just be using that. You don't need to use something else separately like Redis or Memcache to do this transformation and store this separately when you could just be using something like read replication because what you're really after is reducing load on that primary database. Now I mentioned Redis and Memcache and I think this is another fallacy people get into is thinking that all your caching needs to be distributed, meaning that you have to have a central store for that cache. That's really just not the case. There's a lot of situations where rather, depending what you're caching, it could actually just be in memory in your app, in your API. It doesn't necessarily need to be a distributed service like Redis, Memcache, et cetera. And even in a horizontally scaled environment where you have multiple instances behind a load balancer, they still can all have the, their own individual cache. Again, it depends on context and how much you're actually persisting in there, but don't ever really just forget that you can still have kind of a local in-memory cache. Now to piggyback on this a little bit further, if you're doing that kind of data composition, which is gonna be releasing load on your database because you're normally making a bunch of different queries, composing all this data together, now you're gonna cache it. I just wanna piggyback on the idea of whether it has to be kind of something in Redis or Memcache or local, it's just the idea that it could actually still be in your primary database using the exact same infrastructure that you already have, just separately in a separate schema, table, document store, whatever the case may be. You don't necessarily have to jump to something that's what you would typically think of as a cache, because really what you're trying to build here is a read model. Let me illustrate this better in a couple different ways. The first is if we're talking about event sourcing. We're using our event streams, our series of events to represent our state. Typically what happens is we have a command that's gonna mutate the state of our system. That's our event that we're gonna persist. And typically what we do is we'd have some type of project projection that we would optimize for our query side. We'd have some separate read model. So instead of reading our event stream, rather we have kind of a pre-computated uh, read model that's exactly in the form that we need it for our query. This is kind of following the path of CQRS. Now the thing is you could be doing this even if you weren't doing event sourcing, thinking about it this way. Let's say I have you a command that you're using a set of tables and a relational database that's using like third normal form. You may then use some type of computation to persist it separately so that your queries are just hitting more of denormalized tables. So you're not doing all that comp uh, composition with multiple queries or different types of joins that's really time consuming, CPU intensive, whether it be on the app or the database. It's the exact same type of thing. You're really building up something that's optimized for queries. So my point being, just really think about your context and how you wanna persist that data. What serves you best in your context? It could be a local in-memory cache. It could be distributed cache like Redis. It could be using your existing infrastructure and database in separate schemas. 
Use what makes most sense in your context. So now let's talk some strategies on how you're actually gonna use your cache. The first is the write through method where when we have a request to our API where we need to make some type of state change to our database, well now we need to invalidate our cache or update it with new values. So you're gonna do that immediately. This means that you need to be aware of what's in the cache, what's managing that cache, because it's gotta be the exact same thing that knows, okay, I'm changing the state of this record, this object, whatever the case may be. I need to now go update some cache values. And you're gonna do that immediately upon the same request. Now here's a trade off with this method. On the benefit side that your cache is gonna be fully consistent if you're using the same type of database within the same transaction. But if you're not, it's gonna be consistent to the point where that initial request is the one doing both operations and you're gonna to have to handle errors there. However, more likely it's gonna be consistent to other requests. Now on the trade off side is that every write to your database is gonna take longer potentially because you also need to do the operations of updating that cache and dealing with errors. If you update the state but fail to update the cache, you're gonna have inconsistencies there. So there's a trade off there. Another option is called the cache aside or really kind of lazy loading. So when a request comes in to your API, what you need to do is first go check the cache, read from the cache, and if you get a cache hit, the value's there, you can return back to the client, we're all good. If there was no value in our cache and we have a cache miss, at that point we'd go read our database, do whatever data type of data composition we need to do, then we immediately need to go write that to the database to persist the value, then we can return it back to the client. Any subsequent requests coming in, do the exact same thing. So if there's a cache hit, we can just return the value at that point. It's only hitting our database if we get a cache miss. Of course, there's trade-offs here as well. On the benefit side is that our cache actually has less data because we're only gonna be persisting to it what's actually being requested. On the downside is that we're actually making more requests to our cache for data that may not be there. So we're doing more round trips. We're going to the cache, nope, not there. Go to our database, do composition, then go back to the cache. So there's more round trips for that initial population. And you're also gonna to wanna to deal with this scenario, which is you may cause more load to your database than you realize when your cache isn't available. You make a request to your cache, because that lazy method. Let's say the item's not available, so then you gotta reach out to your database. What happens if the item's never getting written to the cache for some reason, or your cache is simply unavailable and it can't make that request? That means it has to go to the database to get the value. That means any subsequent request could be doing the exact same thing, where now you're hitting your database more than you were previously on that kind of the happy path when the cache is available. You're gonna be adding that much more load. All the load that was going to your cache is now going to the database. And that mo may impose way more load than your database is able to handle. So those are the two methods that you can think about on using your cache and you could use them together if you wanted to. We're using the write through where anytime there's a state change, you're updating your cache, as well as you could be using the cache aside because you may be using some type of expiry to invalidate the cache and it may not be there. So you still need to populate it. So let's talk about cache invalidation. The first is just having an expiry, a time to live some length of time before whatever cache you're using is automatically gonna remove that item from the cache. I highly recommend having an expiry, some time to live, but it's very dependent in your context, kind of the volatility of the data, et cetera. You may be asking yourself, well, why? If I'm using the write-through method, I'm updating the cache immediately all the time, why would I still want expiry? And why would I also wanna be kind of using that cache aside lazy method? This happens more than you think, where yeah, you have a cache, your app's doing it, it's the one updating the cache, that app is in control of that. What happens if you have some other process, yourself included, manually connecting to the database and making a state change? Well, the cache didn't get updated. Now you have inconsistencies between the state of your database and your cache. Another option for invalidating your cache or updating it, if you're already using an event-driven architecture and you have all the information about EDA and the infrastructure built in, you can be using events. Let's say for our example, with that book that I was illustrating, somebody added a review, and that was one of the things, the number of reviews. So a review comes in, we could be publishing an event that a the book was reviewed, we could be handling that message, and we can have a separate consumer just handling that book reviewed, and it could be invalidating cache or updating our value about the number of reviews for that item in our cache. So if you're already kind of doing event-driven architecture and messaging, events to me are a great way of doing this because you're doing it asynchronously. So you need to scale your API. Just add a cache, right? No big deal. Well, hopefully I illustrated different things that you need to consider. There isn't really any right or wrong. 
There's just a lot of extra problems that you need to face. One of the things I always say with caching is do it when you absolutely must. In most scenarios, if your database is overloaded, look at the actual way you're querying your database. Can you optimize that first? Having less infrastructure is generally gonna be better than adding more infrastructure, caching, all the things in validation, the different patterns that you're gonna to need to apply. Don't just immediately jump to it because you wanna scale. Think about what you're already using. Can you optimize that first? And of course, get in the comments and provide your tips, things that you've experienced, because I always read these comments and I think, oh yeah, I wanted to mention that and I totally forgot and then somebody left a great comment. So get in there, let me know your experiences, different challenges you face, and kind of how you handled it. And if you want us to take a step further, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server to chat with other software developers. Or if you just want to support my channel, the link's in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts, make sure to leave a comment. Please give it a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.